Okay, <clears throat> let us move on with the electronic spectra. In the last class, we arrived at the result that in order to accurately um, predict the electronic spectra of complexes, we can clear series enough, um, we need terms. And the terms are necessary in order to account for the interactions between the electrons. So that's not accounted for a ligand field theory because the ligand field theory, um, we have orbitals and these are inherently uh, one electron um, functions. So um, we have introduced the concept of the microstates and we have said that um, a set of microstates that has the same energy defines a term. And then we have looked at <clears throat> How um, can we actually find these, these microstates that have the same energy? And in order to do that, we have looked at how the um, um, orbital uh, quantum numbers and the spins add up to give total orbital quantum numbers and, and spins um, that then defines um, a term. So, we have, and that was our last result, discussed the term symbols. And we have seen that the term symbol is defined by the um, uh, total uh, angular orbital quantum number, um, um, capital L. And when L is equal to zero, we call it an S term. This term, an S term, when it's equal to one, we say it's a P term. When L is equal to two, then this is a D term. And when L is equal to three, then we have an F term, okay? Um, but in addition, we also have the, the spins of the ellipses to consider. Um, and that defines the spin multiplicity, which is nothing else but the number of microstates due to the spin, which is defined by the formula two S plus one. Okay, so now how can we um, find um, the number of, of, of microstates and the terms for, for particular um, electron configuration? So let us look at the microstates of what is called the free D through I first. So a D2 ion is an ion rather that has only two d electrons and a free d2 ion is a d2 ion which is not complicated in any way okay so we're only looking at the naked um, d2 ion in the first place so now we can think about well, what microstates are, are possible when we have a d2 ion, ion configuration and we can in order to figure that out, we can create a table um, in which we plot the capital ML values to the right and the capital MS values to the left. So capital ML value are being produced by the addition of the ML values of the individual electrons, which can be in this case only two. And the capital MS values are the values that can be produced by the addition of the addition of the spins. So now um, each, each electron can be in a d orbital uh, that can have ML values varying between minus two and plus two. Okay, so when we have two electrons, then the capital ML value can vary between minus four and plus four. You arrive at plus four when both electrons have the individual ML values of plus two because two plus two is four. And the most negative value is, is minus four. That's the case when both electrons are in orbital with the quantum number ML equal to minus two and then minus two plus minus two gives minus four. Of course, we can have everything, everything in between, okay? And the same is true also for the spins. Okay, we, have the, we can have the case that both spins are spin up. 
then a half plus a half is minus a half, which gives the ms value of plus one here. And so a half plus a half gives one, half plus a half gives one. And when both spins uh, are minus a half, then minus a half plus minus a half gives minus one. And when one electron is spin up and the other electron is spin down, then minus a half uh, plus a half, that gives, that gives zero, okay? So now we need to see, well, what, what combination of MR values and MS values uh, are, are possible. And that gives us all the microstates that they can, can be. Okay. So now if we count these microstates overall here, then these are overall 45 microstates. Uh, you see that uh, some fields are not occupied here because of the Pauli principle. So for instance, when we have capital ML being equal to minus four, you cannot have capital MS being equal to minus one. Why is that? Because both electrons are in the same orbital with the MR value of minus two. Okay, so when they are in the same orbital, one electron must be spin up and the other one must be spin down. Otherwise, you will violate the Pauli principle. Okay, therefore, the MS value of minus one is in this case not possible. The MS value of plus one is also not possible for the same reason. So, for exactly the same arguments, we also cannot have an MR value of plus four and an MS of minus one and plus one, because again, we can realize ML is equal to plus four only when both electrons are in the same orbital with the um, MR values equal to, equal to plus two. Therefore, the spins must be paired and only MS equal to zero is allowed. Um, otherwise, um, we are violating the Pauli principle. Okay, so now another thing that you notice is that these, these fields here are not equally populated. You see that some combinations only allow uh, one microstate. For instance, this combination here with ML is equal to uh, minus three and M is equal to minus one allows only uh, one combination, okay? So this designation says that uh, the first electron has a lowercase mR value of one, uh, sorry, of minus, sorry, of minus two. The second one has an mR value of minus one, okay? And both electrons here are spin down, okay? So minus one, plus minus one, well, that gives us minus three, and minus a half, plus minus a half, well, this gives us minus one. So this is how these numbers here explain why um, this microstate here is in this field. Okay? So now you see um, the maximum microstates uh, exist for the case of ML equal to zero, and MS is equal to zero. So overall, one, two, three, four, five microstates possible. Just as an illustration, we can go through them. So one possibility is that the first electron is in the orbit of ML equal to minus one, and so minus two, and the other one is in the orbital with ML equal to plus two. Okay, minus two plus plus two, that gives zero. Okay, so that explains why the MR value is equal to zero, all right? And now we can have, in this case, the case that one electron has been up and the other electron has been down, okay? And that explains the MS value of zero. Of course, we can also have the case that the first electron has been up and the, and the second electron has been down, yeah? That gives also MS, is equal to zero. We can have the case that, well, the first electron is in an orbital with ML equal to minus one, and the other one is in an orbital with ML is equal to plus one, and then again, minus one plus plus one, that gives zero, explaining 
this zero here. And then again, the spins are being, spins are being paired. So there are two possibilities. In the first possibility, the first electron is spin, spin down, and the second one is spin up. And in the second possibility, the first one is uh, spin up, and the second one is spin down. Okay, so last but not least, we can have the case that both electrons have, are in the, in the orbital with ml is equal to zero, that would be the dz square orbital, okay? And of course, the electrons must be, must be spin paired, must be spin paired in this, in this, in this case. Okay, um, now if you just add up all these possibilities here, yeah, then you will notice that you will have overall 45 microstates. Okay, and um, that is also um, um, predictable from the fact that the um, ML value here, which is the highest is plus four, which defines the capital L value, and that the MS value, the highest MS value is, is uh, plus one, which defines the capital, capital S value. Okay, so over this is two times four plus one times two times one plus one, which gives equal to 45. Okay. So now for general DN electron configuration, um, we can calculate the number of microstates through, through, this, through this formula here. And we can do this even if you don't know the, um, the table for the microstates, which is equal to uh, 10 factorial over 10 minus the number of D electrons uh, factorial uh, times the number of d electrons factorial. So with this formula, you can easily calculate the number of um, possible um, microstates for a particular electron configuration. So now the big question is, which of these 45 microstates are, are energetically equal? Okay, because energetic, a set of energetically equal microstate defines a term. Okay, and that can also be derived from this microstage table. So here's the same microstate table in a somewhat different form. So each possible microstate is here designated by an X. Okay, and the, the, the color uh, is the code for microstates that have the same energy. Okay, so all red axis, X is here, they have the same energy or uh, light blue ones have the same energy or purple ones have the same energy. And you see that there's one black one, which defines also a term. There's only in this case, one microstate that defines a term. So how can we rationalize that? So we can rationalize uh, the terms the following way by drawing boxes into this microstate table. And you start out with the largest possible box. Okay, so the largest possible box that you can draw into the microstate um, table is, is this one here. Okay, and you see it contains now, uh, well, all the uh, microstates that are designated right here, okay? And that now defines the number of, of microstates that belongs to this term, okay? So overall, we have overall uh, 21 microstates here. So it's basically seven times three, which gives 21 microstates. So now you can think about, well, what's the term symbol for this term? And the term symbol is defined by the ML value, the maximum ML value, which defines the L value, capital L value, and the maximum MS value here, which defines the capital MS value. Okay, so now what is the capital ML value? Well, that is three. And therefore, 
L is capital L is equal to three. Okay, now when capital L is equal to three, then that means that we have an F term. Okay, so now what's the spin multiplicity? The spin multiplicity is defined by the capital MS value. Okay, so we see that the capital MS value is equal to plus one. Therefore, the spin multiplicity is two times plus one, yeah, plus one, which is two plus one, which is equal to three. So that means that we have here a three F term with 21 microstates. So now you just draw the next largest box into the microstate table. And the next largest box contains nine microstates. It's actually this box here, together with another box, which is also nine microstates, which is actually this box here. Okay. So now uh, these um, nine microstates here, the blue ones, belong to a particular term. And um, well, these green microstates here, they also belong to a particular term, but these terms are different. Okay, so again, which terms to represent is defined by the term symbol, which is determined by the capital ML and the capital, sorry, the capital L and capital S value. So again, we can write, derive these values from this microstate table. So for this blue box here, the maximum value for ML can be four. Okay, so therefore capital L is equal to four and that defines a G term. Okay, the G term because G follows F in the alphabet. Yeah, it's S, P, D, F, G, H, I, J, K and so forth. Okay, so now what is the largest value for MS? You see for MS only zero is allowed. And that means that the spin multiplicity is two times zero plus one, that is equal to one. And so the spin multiplicity is one. And that means that we have a one G term. So for this other box that contains nine microstates and that's green box, which is the uh, maximum ML value. Maybe one of you can tell me that now. It's actually already on the slide here. So question is too easy. So ML is equal to one. That's the highest number ML can adopt. So L is equal to one, and that makes the term a P term. And then with regard to this spin multiplicity, we see that uh, the maximum spin multiplicity is plus one, uh, sorry, so here plus one, this plus one. And therefore our spin multiplicity is three, two times one plus one, that gives three. So therefore we have here three P term. All right, so now um, our next largest box would be the box that contains all the purple X's here. Can you tell me what is the maximum MR value in this case? Two, yeah, that's correct. So when the maximum ML value is two, then L is two, and that defines which letter? D. Sorry? Uh, D. D, correct. So this is a D term. And what is the maximum MS value in this case? Zero. Zero, okay. 
So that defines a singlet term. So that here is our next largest box that we can draw. And that defines a one D term. So now what's left? Well, we see there's only a single microstate left, which is this one here, yeah, which defines its own term. And well, the maximum ML value, the maximum MS value is zero. Okay, so that makes this term a one S term. All right. So now we have really found all the terms for our D2 electron configuration, assuming that we have a D3 D2I, which is not compensated in any, in any way. So now the next question is, what's the relative energy of these terms? So the term with the lowest energy, that would be the ground state, and terms with higher energy would be well, excited state terms. All right, so now in order to find the energy, we apply Hund's rule of spin multiplicity. And Hund's rule says, well, the higher the spin multiplicity, the lower the energy. So the term with the higher spin multiplicities um, will have the lower energy, have the lower energies. So now when the spin multiplicity is the same, then the energy increases with increasing L value. Okay? So that's somewhat the opposite of what happens with orbitals. Okay? With orbitals, we have learned that S is the lowest, and then comes P, and then comes D, and then comes F. Yeah? With the terms, it's the other way around. Okay? So F would be lower than uh, then D, which would be lower than uh, P, which would be lower than S. Okay, so now um, applying these rules, what would be the sequence of energy for the terms of our uh, 2Di? So we previously determined that we have both triplet terms and then what this 3F term and the 3P term as well as singlet terms, which would be the 1D and the 1S term. Okay, so now according to the rules, the, the triplet terms should be lower in energy than the singlet terms. So among the triplet terms, the 3F should be lower in energy than the 3P, according to rule number two. Okay, because F stands for a uh, a higher uh, uh, energy as a soy R value in comparison to in comparison to P. Okay. Um, then for the singlet states, the G term is the lowest energy term. Then comes D and then comes S. So S has the lowest L value. So therefore it has the highest energy. Okay. And G has the highest L value. And actually this is incorrect. I just see this. So the energy decreases with increasing L value. Yeah. Uh, decrease. So please correct this. I need to correct this in a future slide. So this is correct, but this here is a type which has to decrease with increasing our value. Okay, now Hund's rule is called a rule and not a law because there are exceptions from the rule. And indeed, for this electron configuration, um, there's an exception. And the outlier here is the 1D term. So if you, if, you, if you calculate the energies, quantum mechanically, you will find that the 3F term is the lowest energy term as predicted, but then there's the 1D, the 3P, the 1G, 
into one S. Okay, so there can be exceptions from the rule. At this point, um, within the scope of this class, we do not uh, deep, dig deeper into the question as to why these exceptions uh, occur. Simple answer is it's because Hund's rule is only a rule, and not a, and not a, not a law. So usually, spin multiplicity determines the energy, but there can be exceptions to that. Okay, so now we can analyze the free ion terms also for the other electron configurations. Okay, so far we discussed only D2, but there are nine other possible electron configurations. So, for example, we have, when we have a D1 electron configuration, then we only have a single term, consider, and that single term is a 2D term. So we can very easily understand why this term is a 2D term and why there's only one. There's basically only one because there are no electron-electron interactions to consider, okay? Um, so why is this term a, a 2D term? Well, when we have only one electron, then in order to determine the term symbol, we would place that electron into the orbital with the highest, highest ML value, okay? Because in this case, capital ML is equal to lowercase ML because the sum of the ML values is just defined by the ML value of that single electron that we have. So therefore, our electron would be in the D orbital, which is associated with the ML value of plus two, so when the ML value is plus two, then also the capital L value is plus two, and that defines a D term, okay? So note though that associated with this term, there are also of course other microstates possible because the number of microstates is always two L plus one, all right? So in this case, two L plus one would be Five. Five, yeah, and that and that basically means nothing else. But well, you could fill this one electron also into any of these other orbitals, yeah, and it would not matter in energy. Why wouldn't it matter in energy? Because well, there are no electron-electron interactions to consider, and for that reason, really all these orbitals are energetically energetically equal. It doesn't matter in which. Uh, one, you fill the electron. All right. So now what about the spin multiplicity? So we have only one electron to consider. So in order to maximize capital MS, we choose the spin of this electron to be spin up. Yeah. Then it's plus a half. Okay. And then capital MS is also plus a half. And then that defines that defines s to be also plus a half, and then the spin multiplicity is nothing but two s plus one. Okay, so two times a half, well, that's one, and one plus one that gives two, and that now explains why this is a duplet term here. All right, so in sum, ml is equal to capital ML and ML max max is equal to L which is two and MS is equal to capital MS which is equal to uh, capital S is a half times when is equal to a half and then two S plus one is two times a half plus one which is two and this two here defines this spin multiplicity Okay, so now again, what, what does that, that actually, what does it actually say? It says that um, it doesn't matter if this electron has been up or has been down, yeah, um, the energy of the microstates is always the same. Again, that is because there are no electron-electron interactions possible. 
right. So um, now we already discussed the electrification D2. Um, when we go to D3, D4, and D5, we of course can have more different terms because there are more possible combinations of of electrons in the orbital, so there are more permutations possible. The number of microstates uh, increases and the number of terms um, also in increases. And uh, if we really wanted to um, derive all these terms, we would again have to, well, construct the microstate table and then derive the term symbols from that. I'm not going through this again in detail. It's nothing new to learn. We've already done it for the D2 electron formation. I'm just presenting you here the, the result. So for the D3 electron configuration, we have, for instance, have uh, a 2D term, a 4P term, a 4F term, a 2P term, another 2D, um, another 4F, uh, another 2 we have a 2G and a 2H. Okay, and um, what would be expected, what would be the expected ground term? We would see here that well, the high spin multiplicity is four, okay? And F has the higher L value than P, so we would expect that the four F value, uh, the four F term is our, is our ground term. So you see that for the D4 electron configuration, we have even more terms. And for the D5 electron configuration, we have the most terms just because statistically they are the most um, permutations possible. And if you go from D5 to D6 to D7 to D8 to the D9, then we'll find that for D6 is the same as D4, D7 is the same as D3, D8 is the same as D2, and D9 is the same as D1. The reason for this is that the well, uh, occupied uh, slots in these orbitals permutate the same way as the non-occupied ones. Okay, and for that reason, the uh, D4 is equivalent to D6. So, well, um, because in the D4 we have well, four filled slots and six empty slots, while for D6 we have um, six filled slots and four empty slots. But from the standpoint of statistical permutation, this is the same. And therefore, the uh, Terms are the same. Okay, for the same reason, D3 is equivalent to D7, D8 is equivalent to D2, and D9 is equivalent to D1. So finally, we also have the D10 electron configuration. And the D10 electron configuration is defined again by a single term. And that term is a 1s term, we can easily understand again why we have a single term and why this single term is a 1s term. Okay, we just need to consider that when we have the 10 electron configuration, all our orbitals are being completely full and therefore there are no permutations possible. Okay, uh, therefore. Our term is, we have only one term which is defined by a single microstate. Yeah? And that term is 1s because when you analyze the, post, the highest possible uh, ML value, you realize it's zero because all the minus and pluses here cancel out. Yeah? Um, so L is equal to capital ML, which is equal to about two times minus two plus two times minus one plus two times zero plus two times plus one plus two times plus two. And that overall just gives zero. 
So that means that capital L is equal to zero and that defines our S term. Um, now with regard to spin multiplicity, you see that, well, the spins are all paired. So we have five electrons that have plus a half, five electrons of minus a half, and five times plus a half, plus five times minus a half, well, that gives again zero. And that's the only value that we can have. And therefore, S is equal to zero, and that defines a single term. Okay? All right. Um, so there's one more thing that we need to um, consider, which is called the spin orbit coupling. So thus far, we have only considered the interactions of the, of the spins, okay, how one spin interacts with another spin, and how um, the, well, the, the orbital momenta of the electrons interact with each other. But there's also an interaction between the magnetic moments due to the angular orbital momentum and the magnetic moment associated with the spin. Okay, and that's called spin orbit coupling. And for that, um, we need another quantum number. This is called the quantum number J. And the quantum number J can vary between R plus S and R minus S. And because of that, we can create now even more, more states, even more terms due to that spin orbital coupling. Okay, so therefore <clears throat> a full term symbol is described by L subscript, uh, sorry, L superscript 2s plus 1 subscript j. So here are a few examples. Um, so how many states belong to a 3p, 1d, and 1s term under the consideration of the spin orbit coupling? So let's start with the 3p. So we have to ask um, which values can J adopt um, for a 3p term? And to answer that question, we have to consider what are the L and the S values for a 3p term? So for P term, L is equal to one, and um, S is also equal to one. So the maximum value J can adopt is one plus one is equal to two, okay? But the minimum value J can adopt is L minus S, okay? And that means L minus S is equal to one minus one, which is equal to zero. So overall, J can adopt values, the values zero, one, and two. So that means our three P term can split up into a three P zero and a three P one and a three P two due to the spin orbit coupling. So now what about the one D? So for the one D, L plus S is two plus zero is equal to two. Why is that? Because a D term is associated with a quantum number L of equal to two, and a singlet term is associated with a quantum number S is equal to zero. Okay, so therefore two plus zero is equal to two. So now what does L minus S give? Well, two minus zero, that gives also two. So therefore in this case, J can adopt only a single value, and that is two. So therefore, in this case, our 1D term doesn't split up in energy because J can only adopt one value, which is designate that J value. So we have, in this case, 1D2 term. So last one at least, let's consider the 1s term. So what is L plus S? Well, 
L is equal to zero and S is equal to zero and zero plus zero gives zero. So what is L minus S? Well, zero minus zero, that gives also zero. <coughs> and therefore also in this case, there's only one value for J allowed, which is in this case zero. And therefore also a one S term does not split in energy and we can designate it one S zero if we want to account for the spin orbit couple. So now when it comes to the interpretation of electronic spectra, um, usually the spin orbit coupling is neglected because it only leads to very narrow energy splits, which are not associated with energy transition in the, in, in the visible or uh, just IR or IR uh, uh, region. So the energy amounts are way too small in order to be relevant for the elect uh, electronic spectra and absorption spectra. So therefore, usually the spin orbit coupling is being neglected and we only consider the L values, the S values, but not the J values. All right, um, then can maybe continue this a little bit for the next 10 minutes. And now take into account the effects of a ligand field, for instance, octahedral ligand field. So thus far, we have only considered three ions that are not complicated in any way. So now let us go to actually complicated ions. So what is the term splitting when there's actually an octahedral ligand field present? And now it becomes even more complicated because the terms can split up in, in even more other terms due to the presence of uh, the ligand field. Okay, however, it's not very hard to understand because the terms, they split up in energy in the same way as orbitals do. So for the example of an octahedral ligand field, a D term would split up in energy the same way as a D orbital. And you've learned in ligand field theory that when we have D orbitals, they split up into EG and T2G orbitals. So therefore, um, a D term splits up into microstates with EG and uh, T2G symmetry. And uh, the EG uh, microstates have the same energy and all the T2G microstates would also have the same energy. Okay, now a P term would actually not split up in energy. Um, a P orbital in an octahedral ligand field has T2, has T1G symmetry. We have to determine this previously. So all the P orbits are triply degenerate. And so the microstates of a P term, they are also triply degenerate and have T1G symmetry. So an S term um, also doesn't split up an energy. It has A1G symmetry because an S orbit has A1G symmetry. And for instance, an F term would have, uh, would split up in three terms. One has, which is trivially generated and has T1G symmetry. One is also trivially generated and has T2G symmetry. And the last one, which is A2G symmetry. Okay. So now that uh, complicates everything one step more because we have to consider that um, energy splitting and now how much uh, that energy is split de depends now on the, on the ligand field strength. 
okay? Which depends on the actual ligand that surrounds our surrounds our eye. Okay, so let us assume uh, the uh, two metal complex, which is octahedral, and let us look at the energies of the resulting terms as a function of the ligand field strength. And that can be viewed in what is called a correlation diagram. Okay. So now if we have no field, then we have 3F, 1D, 3P, 1G, 1S for the two electron configuration we determined this previously. Yeah. And now under the influence of our octahedral ligand field, there's a split in energy. Yeah. So the 3F splits into um, A2G, T2G, T1G, we discussed this. A 1D splits into EG and T2G, 3P well, gives single T1G, the G term gives these four here and this S term again um, doesn't, doesn't split. So now the, the energy of all these resulting terms is now a function of the strength of the field. So the energies of some of the terms move, move up and the energy of other terms move down depending on the field of the strength of the field. Okay. So um, the interesting thing is that as you go to very strong fields, the, um, there is the emergence of three groups of terms that uh, tend to adopt the same energy. And if you go to a theoretical infinitely strong field, um, then they become even all the same. So these, these three would have exactly the same energy. These four would have exactly the same energy. And these four would also have exactly the same, the same energy. Um, and that can be explained by the fact that when you have an infinitely strong field, the external electric field is so much stronger than the electric field that actually leads to the generation of the terms so that the electrostatic interactions between the electrons can be neglected and our, our electrons behave as though there were no electron electron interactions. Okay. And so we could say that, well, this group of terms represents the case in which well, we just have both electrons here in the ground state. If you go back to the orbital picture, so we could say that this is the T2G2 state. So in this intermediate state, we would have one electron in the TG orbitals and one in the EG orbitals. So that would be a T2G EG state. And in this case here, it would have both electrons ex excited and we have an EG2 state. However, this infinitely strong field is basically hypothetical in practice, you will have everything between it the weak field and the very strong field, and the most cases will lie in between. Okay. And of course, we can easily see from that that there are now many different states possible. And that would argue that the electronic spectra should look extremely complicated. So the answer is, and maybe that's the last point, it's not fortunately not as complicated because of what is called the selection rules. Okay, there are two selection rules that forbid certain electron transitions. So in the first one is the so-called spin selection rule that states that transitions, only transitions with delta S is equal to zero is allowed. 
So for instance, you can excite from a triplet state into another triplet state or from a singlet state into another singlet state, but not for instance, from a triplet state into a singlet state or vice versa. And the second rule is the so-called Laporte rule, which states that only transitions with change of parity are allowed. So for instance, a G state can be excited in the U state or a U state can be excited into a G state, but a G state cannot be excited in another G state. So however, um, the Laporte rule does not hold strictly, it just reduces the likelihood of the transition, but it does still give a decent likelihood for this transition to happen. While the spin selection rule holds strictly, so the spin selection rule diminishes the probability of the transition to practically zero or at least almost so. Okay. Therefore, with the help of these selection rules, we can now um, simplify our considerations when we want to predict the electronic spectra of an octahedral complex of a particular electron configuration. Okay, but we'll stop at this point. Our time is over. <laughs>